Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Joining me today, Michael Barone. Michael is a senior writer for U.S. News and World Report, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, the author of many books, including most recently, Our First Revolution, The Remarkable British Upheaval That Inspired America's Founding Fathers, and he is the principal co-author of this Bible of American Politics, the Almanac of American Politics. I am holding up the 2006 edition. The 2008 edition will be available. Is shipping. Is shipping. Go to Amazon and order the 2008 edition of the Almanac of American Politics. Michael, I will put to you paradoxes from American politics. Okay. On the one hand this, on the other hand that, and you will draw upon your Tocquevillian understanding of American politics to describe to me the deeper meaning that explains these apparent paradoxes. Well, with the proviso that I may prove to be more Al D'Amato than Al de Tocqueville. But we'll... <laughs> I doubt that. The utter collapse of the Republican Party and the near upset in Massachusetts. On the one hand, the GOP appears in a state of collapse. Democratic presidential candidates out fundraising Republican candidates by 50 percent and more. Uh, here's, to me, the most telling fact. Just five years ago, voter identification showed 43% Republican, 43% Democrat. Today, 35% Republican, 50% Democrat. That's on the one hand. On the other, a Republican just was elected governor of Louisiana, heavily Democratic state, and you were the journalist who caught, drew this to my attention. In another heavily Democratic state, Massachusetts, the Democrat, in a special election for the House of Representatives, the Democrat defeated the Republican by just six percentage points in a district in which John Kerry defeated George W. Bush by 16 percentage points. On the one hand this, on the other hand that. Uh, explain. Yes, uh, explain. The, the, the explanation, I think, is this, Peter. Uh, for about 10 years, from 1995 to 2005, we were in a period of what I call trench warfare politics. The two parties' constituencies were like two armies in a culture war arrayed against each other in the trenches, trying to win over that little bit of ground that meant the difference between victory and defeat. Equal sized groups, as some of those party identification figures uh, you mm -hmm. put down suggest. And the election results, whether you're looking at president or house, pretty close throughout that whole period. And there wasn't much uh, party switching. I think since sometime in 2005, maybe the week of Hurricane Katrina, we've been in a period of open field politics where voters are moving around, politicians are moving around. It's like the period between 90 and 95 when you had the, you know, the, uh, an incumbent president's percentage goes down 17 points, the Republicans win the House for the first time in 40 years, right. where third party candidates zoom to the top of the polls in presidential elections, so Ross Perot at one point, Colin Powell right. at another, uh, in which voters are moving around. So I think that, that it's a moment of peril for both parties, it's a moment of opportunity for both parties. So you see the Republicans doing better in Massachusetts 5. Uh, this is a district 57 percent for Kerry. Uh, the Democratic index it for 06 would probably be about 61 percent. Their candidate gets only 51 percent. The right. Republican is now campaigning against the Congress, which of course the Republicans controlled for 12 years but don't anymore. Um, the Republicans well, may well, face peril in, some, in the special election that's coming up in the Ohio 5th uh, district. This was a 61 percent Bush district. Uh, I suspect the Republican candidate will not get 61 percent in that election. For Ohio specific reasons? Ohio... Well, Ohio has been a particular collapse for the Republican Party. They held the governorship and the legislature for 16 years. That length of control hasn't been seen in Ohio since the 1840s, which was just a little before my time and I wasn't covering that. Uh, and the uh, and, and they raise taxes. The state's economy is it clearly in trouble. They've been haven't been gaining jobs, so there's a reaction against the Republicans there. What what's the pattern here in American history, at least recent American history, between the frozen politics, trench warfare, bitter fighting for just inches, and suddenly the situation, or relatively suddenly, the situation becomes fluid. What did it? What enabled the Republicans to recapture the House in 94? What event? Is it Iraq now? What's, what's going on? Well, I think what we saw in the earlier period, 90 to 95, of, uh, of trench warfare politics is that one thing, that voters get tired of uh, the reiteration of certain kinds of political battles, particularly if they're attended with a certain amount of, uh, of clash, of inconclusive mm -hmm. results. Uh, 
you know, go, starting in 1990, most Washington insiders said we were always going to have a Republican president. We were always going to have a Democratic Congress. It was a staple of American political science. And within science, four right. years, both of those rules had fallen, and we right. nearly got an independent president at one point. So voters get tired of it. They get uh, upset with conditions. Um, we, we're accustomed to thinking political scientists uh, have these formulas that are based on economic conditions. I don't think that's the big moving thrust in politics today. People may complain about the economy, uh, but the median voter in 2008 was born in 1966. That voter has lived 95% of his or her adult lifetime in a period of low inflation economic growth. Yes, they get irritated when even the mildest economic problem surfaces or, you know, things seem somewhat uncertain. Uh, but they're not people that remember the Great Depression of the 1930s. They're not voting that way. They're voting more often in our period of trench warfare politics on cultural issues. Mm -hmm. Are you, you know, traditional culture, uh, liberation-minded culture? Uh, the, it's a civil war of the baby boomers of the 60s and exemplified by our two baby boomer presidents, Bill Clinton and George, George w. w. Bush. Which brings me to the second one. It's a quagmire, but we're winning. Iraq. On the one hand, all the polls indicate that the American people are just sick of this war. On the other hand, listen to this from John Burns, who of course until very recently was the uh, Iraqi bureau chief for the New York Times. Quote, there's no doubt that those 30,000 extra American troops are making a difference in the surge. Fewer car bombs, quite remarkably low, lower levels of civilian casualties. Al-Qaeda has taken a beating. Close quote. Things are going well in Iraq, but the politics are still substantially anti-Iraq. Uh, well, people, uh, you know, this this war has been uh, has been covered by our mainstream media as as a quagmire, as a uh, you know unending uh, bloodshed. Uh, you know, by historical standards, of course, casualties, American casualties, casualties of all kinds, are are remarkably low. I mean, if you compare it, you know, we lost more people in the first 48 hours of D-Day than right. we've lost in Iraq. Uh, in five years. Since, you know, five, four or five but, years. I think people want to see progress. I think in the 06 elections, uh, the choice before them seemed a choice between stalemate and withdrawal. And in that circumstance, I think people favored withdrawal. Well, now the news uh, that you reported from John Burns, who's one of the great foreign correspondents of our time, uh, that's percolating slowly through the American politics. The, the guardians of the gates of mainstream media don't think progress in Iraq is news. They're on record. People like Robin Wright of the Washington Post are on record right. that. But, but the word, you, you see the polling evidence. Uh, you see upticks in uh, whether we're winning the war on terror in the Rasmussen poll, uh, whether things are going better in Iraq and so forth. And I think... Uh, Your formulation there, though, that the American people are not anti-Iraq, they're anti-stalemate. Yeah, if the that choice has profound implications for the current political. Uh, well, if, yes. If, 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 that, for example, John McCain may not be out of it at all. Yeah, if the choice right? if the choice is between stalemate and withdrawal, pe Americans prefer withdrawal. If the choice is between success and withdrawal, I think Americans prefer success. All right. Is there a, a is there a realistic prospect of success within a period of time uh, near enough to us to affect the presidential election? Uh, I think the answer. I think the answer is yes. I think uh, you know public opinion. We're we're, we're sitting here, uh, um, you know, uh, approximately 52 weeks before the presidential election. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, it, go back, Peter, to the 1979-80 cycle. Right. You're old enough to remember. I that. can remember that. And I'm uh, sorry to say, at this time in the 1979-80 cycle, if you'd asked Washington insiders who was most likely to be the next president, if you'd asked them then or a couple weeks before, they would have said Edward Kennedy. Right. Uh, number two would be Jimmy Carter. They wouldn't get to Ronald Reagan until number four or John five. Anderson, actually. There were polls of the media at the time John Anderson came in ahead of, uh, of Ronald, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. And right. yet, and yet uh, 12 months later, Ronald Reagan carried 44 of 50 states. Between that time, we'd had some pretty big events. The seizure of our diplomats as hostages in Iran, uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. President Carter said his eyes were opened to the Soviet menace. Um, we don't know what events are going to happen in the next 12 months. My uh, belief is that uh, American opinion on Iraq is going to become more positive and there's going to be an increasing apprehension that we're achieving something in the nature of success and the Democrats don't stand so strongly for withdrawal. Hillary Clinton, John Edwards, Barack Obama have all said, September 23rd I believe, that uh, they expect there would be U.S. troops in Iraq at the end of a presidential term which they're seeking. 
So, so they're already repositioning themselves. So the question is, uh, are you for success or stalemate? People prefer success. Got it. Tax hikes and tax cuts. <clears throat> President Bush's tax cuts are set to expire in 2010. We now have, just within the last couple of weeks, two proposals before us. Proposal one, Democrat Charlie Rangel, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, has proposed eliminating the alternative minimum tax, but increasing taxes by 4% on every individual who makes $150,000 a year or more, and all couples who make $200,000 a year or more, which, combined with the expiration of the Bush tax cuts, means that the top rate will go from 35% to 44%. Proposal one. Proposal two. Conservatives in the House, Republicans led by Republican Paul Ryan of Wisconsin, have put together a package under which taxpayers will be offered a choice. Continue to be taxed under the current system or give up all your deductions and find yourself taxed at a flat rate of 10% on the first 100,000 and 25% on everything above that. So on the one hand, you've got Charlie Rangel is talking about simplicity and reform, but as best I can make it out, this is a tax increase and it, the system will remain complicated. On the other hand, you've got Republicans, it feels like the Kemp-Roth bill of 1981, genuine simplicity and overall a sharp, re, uh, a sharp cut in the overall tax burden. Are these two people, these two sets of people inhabiting the same political universe? Well, I think taxes are re-emerging as an issue. Taxes have not been a particularly big issue since 1994 and 1996. George W. Bush advocated tax cuts, persuaded Congress to put them into effect. It was never a big political plus for him. Mm. Uh, he may have hoped it would be. It wasn't. But now we're faced with a situation where the Bush tax cuts expire in 2010. The estate tax comes back in full force in 2011. Uh, and I think that puts the tax issue back on the table because th those things will happen unless the next Congress acts. And Democrats have made it pretty clear that they want some of the Bush tax cuts to expire. They say it's only those on the rich. Uh, Republicans have said, hey, when they're talking about taxing the rich, they're really talking about taxing the ordinary middle class right. person. Right. Uh, that's an argument that, that I think we may see. Uh, Charlie Rangel's tax cut, uh, fascinatingly, basically is a redistribution of the tax burden, taking it off people who make between $100,000 and $250,000, putting it on people that make $500,000 or more. It's not exactly giving to the poor. Uh, one of the things that's going on is that this alternative minimum tax right. that was initially intended to hit 150 people in the whole country uh, is now threatening to hit 21% of tax-paying households. And those tax-paying households are concentrated in Democratic areas. They're in the high-tax, high-nominal-income states, states uh, where the AMT causes you to lose your deductibility of state and local taxes, which are typically very high in those states. So you're right. looking at Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, California, California. Yes. and so forth. Those states are overwhelmingly represented by Democrats. If 21 percent of all taxpayers are going to be subjected to AMT, it's going to be more like 35 to 40 percent in New Jersey. That's going to get their attention, and the public employee unions don't want this to happen because if, if people can't deduct their state and local taxes, they're going to increase their overall tax burden. They're going to be pressure for cutting taxes and spending at the state and local level. The, those unions are a huge constituency in the Democratic Party. So Charles Rangel is floating this proposal to get rid of the AMT, which the Democrats have mm. to do. The Republicans want low rates. I think there's the possibility of a bipartisan cut like the 1986 cut where you get rid of uh, tax preferences and cut rates overall and in this case ditch the AMT uh, or you know, t take some care of it. There's a bipart possibility of bipartisan action and I think Rangel's bill which curiously gives most tax relief to people over a hundred thousand dollars not historically the Democratic constituency, but they are now, Right, uh, is an indication that, that, that the, the ingredients for a bipartisan bill are there. doesn't guarantee it will pass. Doesn't this strike you as odd, or at least very interesting, that these proposals are originating in the House and not from any of the presidential campaigns? Well, it strikes me as interesting that, uh, you know, Mr. Rankle says he's 76 years old and he can't wait around a few more terms for uh, uh, his chance to legislate. He was basically shut out of the legislative process when he was ranking uh, minority member by Chairman Bill Thomas. Uh, 
you know, I th the House is supposed to originate tax legislation, so I think you can say Mr. Rangel's acting responsibly by bringing forward a proposal. Here's my, I guess this is my point. Uh, shouldn't a Republican presidential candidate be m much more foursquarely in favor of some sort of tax reform than we've yet heard? I, just... I think I think it kind of I think it, the situation does cry out for that. In the Massachusetts five special election, uh, that's uh, the the Republican called for uh, tax cuts, not raising the taxes. That didn't win him votes as compared to Bush 04 numbers mm -hmm. in the richest parts of the district. But it got him a lot of votes in the sort of middle income, above national median average, but not really rich sort of areas. He did better than Bush did by six to nine percent in those districts, those those so towns. Ordinary American households are starting to care about taxes again. Well, and look what happened in Britain over the last six weeks. Uh, the uh, the Prime Minister Gordon Brown had been planning to call an election, a uh, yes. general election, in the beginning of November. He hoped to increase the later Labor Party seat. Since he's become prime minister in June and July, August, and September, the polls showed the Labor Party ahead by 9%. That would allow them to increase their parliamentary majority in the House of Commons, and it would be Mr. Brown's majority, not Mr. Lock Blair's. him in for five years. Um, he decided not to do it. Why? Uh, the two-party conferences, the conservatives, who've been avoiding all talk of tax cuts uh, under the leader David Cameron for two years, suddenly said they wanted to cut the uh, inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. No more estate tax on estates under one million pounds, which is about two million dollars. Not, you would think, a populist proposal, but the numbers have changed. In the four polls that have been taken uh, since the party conferences, uh, conservatives are actually ahead by two points. Mm -hmm. That's a big shift uh, in the context of British politics, where for most of the time from 1992 to 2006, there wasn't much movement in the polls at all. And it suggests that a tax issue, um, when it's squarely posed, uh, might be able to shake a lot of votes up. Well, especially this notion of a fluid period in American politics, the open field politics. That's right. I think, uh, you know, the evidence from Mass 5, the evidence uh, from Southeast, from Britain, from the affluent areas. Telephone just outside this door. After this taping, you go out and uh, call Rudy Giuliani, would you please? And well, actually, tell him to come I, out for a tax cut? I just turned off my cell phone because I didn't want to get a call from his wife. <laughs> All right. Health care. Listen to this. 1993, Clinton administration proposes health care reform, Hillary Care, the centerpiece of which is a mandate that would have required employers to provide health insurance. Republicans denounce it. It's defeated. In 2006, Mitt Romney enacts a health care reform in Massachusetts. He's then governor of Massachusetts that includes a mandate more direct than anything Hillary Clinton would have dreamt of. A mandate directly, not on employers, but on citizens. Under Romney Care, every adult in Massachusetts must purchase health insurance or face steep penalties. So he brings the coercive power of the state to bear directly on every adult citizen of Massachusetts. Mitt Romney is now campaigning for president as a conservative Republican. Please explain. Well, I think the, the difference between the Clinton proposal in 93, the Romney proposal in 06, is evidence that we're moving away from employer mandates. I mean, the hope of uh, Clinton, a lot of the, Hillary Clinton 15 years ago, a lot of people on the left was that uh, we'd get every employer to cover every employee. And it's become increasingly clear people change jobs. Small employers can't afford it. They can't get large Just enough pool. Uh, and that it's, it's, it's not a progressive policy. I mean, President Bush proposed in his State of the Union that we equalize the treatment of employer-provided and non-employer-provided health insurance by giving people a tax credit right, right. Uh, when they buy their own insurance. Ron Wyden, Democratic senator from Oregon, uh, has come forward with a proposal along with Bob Bennett, Republican of Utah, uh, which takes this a step farther, which basically says that you, uh, that, that we get, that we get rid of the advantage to employer provided health insurance. And Senator Wyden points out that the people who get the biggest advantage of this are high, high, high earner employees. Mm -hmm. And the people who get the most disadvantage from it are low earner people who don't get employer provided health care insurance. In other words, if you're concerned about the little guy and want to take away a subsidy from the person who's quite comfortable, uh, you want to get rid of the advantage for employer provided health insurance. So my sense is that that's one of the things that was behind Mitt Romney's uh, proposal. And I think that's uh, that's an idea that's that that's out there, ready to be taken up. Uh, now, for for 
years and years, if not at least a couple of decades, all the polls indicate that Americans believe the Democratic Party is better equipped to deal with health care. And it is certainly the case that if you simply say, I want health care for all Americans, there's a direct and immediate appeal of that formulation, which tends to be the Democratic formulation. However, do you think Mitt Romney, who incidentally now that he's running for president, has put forward a proposal that calls for just this kind of thing, that uh, tax advantaging individuals who don't get yeah. employer provided health care. Is there some way Republicans, are the dynamic, are there kind of structural underlying dynamics of this issue permanently in favor of the Democrats, or is there a way Republicans can play health care, this issue, to their advantage? Well, I think there's there's one dynamic that's permanently in to the advantage of the Democrats, the sense that they're going to spend more of somebody else's money to help you out. Right. Okay. Uh, the dynamic that works for the Republicans is the dynamic that says, look, government provided uh, uh, care uh, doesn't work very well. Rudy Giuliani, who has had prostate cancer, points out that 83 percent of people in the United States with prostate cancer live, whereas only the figure in Britain with the National Health Service is 44 percent. Um, you know, if you have to wait two years for your prostatectomy, uh, you might, your, the disease might advance during that period. Uh, you know, I, I think there's uh, people, uh, people historically in the last generation have understood that government provision, government bureaucracy, uh, government mandates don't work so well. That's because they remember the stagflation right. and the uh, gas lines of the 1970s. Uh, the bad news for the Republican side of this argument is that half the voters in 2008, the median age voter, doesn't remember right. the 1970s. They have to make these arguments again. Uh, I think the arguments are there to be made. Uh, I think that uh, the Giuliani example is one way in which you can vividly make the argument. Uh, but we can't take for granted because the Clinton health care plan was rejected in 93, 94, that voters feel the same way. The voters, uh, you know, this is 15 years later. Uh, the electorate is different and has had a different set of experiences. Okay. Hillary and Rudy, two losers in first place. First Hillary, a story in the Associated Press. Quote, Democratic leaders fret that Senator, Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton may be too polarizing for much of the country. In more than 40 interviews, Democratic candidates, consultants, and party chairs from every region pointed to internal polls that give Clinton strikingly high, unfavorable ratings close. Quote, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, Senator Clinton has built a commanding lead after uh, Barack Obama moving in on her some months ago. Her lead is now commanding. Fox News has her 17 points ahead of Barack Obama nationally. Explain. Uh, well, if you look at Hillary Clinton's favorables, unfavorables, there's a little bit of variation, but they tend to come out on the order of 49 percent favorable, 47 percent unfavorable. Uh, to me, and they're relatively static, aren't they? Relatively static. Uh, you know, she's been a national figure of importance for 15 years. You know, get two p for the price of one. We were told in right. the 1992 campaign, she was a leader on the health care proposal. She's uh, she's taken a substantive role on issues for a long time, and uh, she leads people at that. You know, 49 to 47. What does that mean in practical terms? It means a, she can win. B, she can lose. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, if, for that, I had to buy the, the almanac of American politics. Well, no. I think I think Democrats would prefer to have a candidate that doesn't have attribute B. Right. Uh, but there isn't one really because Barack, o the alternatives on on offer, Barack Obama, John Edwards, Bill Richardson are not well enough known that you can guarantee they can't lose. Right. Uh, you know, there's a downside risk in each of them, their cases. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton polarizes people the way her husband did and the way that uh, George W. Bush does. It's a kind of, I call it a civil war in the baby boom generation. Presidents Bush and Clinton were both born in 1946, the first year of the baby boom generation. They both graduated from high school in 1964, the year of peak SAT scores, and they both happen to have personal characteristics, which people on the other side of the cultural divide absolutely loathe. Uh, they're like scratching your fingernails on the blackboard to people of the opposite political view. Hillary Clinton inherits some of that. I think what she and her advisors are going to try and do is to take, you know, take off the hard edge to try and raise those favorables, lower the unfavorables. She's taken to... Are they succeeding? Do you see any sense in the, or do you see any data, let's put it that way, that people are beginning to warm to her? Well, I see data that says over the last uh, six weeks she's been running uh, further, she's been running ahead right. of the Republican candidates in most of the polls. Uh, 
against many of them, at least outside the margin of error, have been running a little better than in the months before. Mm -hmm. I don't think those changes are of huge significance, but they at least suggest that she might be making a little headway in that direction. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky when you've got such high negatives and you're a well-known figure. The problem is, you know, when people know a hundred things about you, thing 101 doesn't change their view very much. When they right. know three things about you, thing number four can change their view quite a right. lot. Right. Rudy, again, on the one hand, on the other. On the one hand, listen to Pat Buchanan, quote, pro-abortion, anti-gun, again and again, Giuliani strutted up Fifth Avenue in the June Gay Pride Parade. A Giuliani presidency would represent repudiation by the Republican Party of the moral, social, and cultural content that once defined it as an institution, close quote. On the other hand, once again, the polls. In the race for the Republican presidential nomination, Rudy Giuliani has taken first place in virtually every national poll for two years. Uh, well, I think Rudy Giuliani enters this race which, with a political asset that very few presidential candidates in our history have ever had. One question you ask about a presidential candidate is can he or she handle a crisis? Can they stand up mm -hmm. under the pressure? And usually you don't know the answer. You look for clues. You ask people from their home state. Uh, you try to find out more about them. With Rudy Giuliani, you don't have to ask the question. You know the answer. Uh, and I think uh, as you look back in history, uh, the last presidential candidate that had that asset, Dwight Eisenhower in 1952. Right. I think right. Herbert Hoover had that asset in 1928 because Americans knew how he had organized the relief the effort relief. in Belgium, right. the food effort in Russia, and how he'd handled the Mississippi River floods in 1927, the year before he ran for president. So it's a rare political asset. Hoover and Eisenhower both won even though they, the base of their parties thought they were a little too liberal, a little too progressive. Uh, uh, that asset served them in good stead uh, in getting nominated and getting elected. And I think with Rudy Giuliani, uh, for some voters who disagree with his views on cultural issues, uh, it trumps uh, those concerns. Uh, as one woman told the radio talk show host Hugh Hewitt, um, all that stuff doesn't matter if we're attacked. Rudy will keep us safe. Right. All right. Um, quick round here. <clears throat> I'll name a candidate in a word or two, a sentence or two. You give me the greatest strength and the worst weakness. Okay. All right. This is political password, sort of. Hillary Clinton. Strength. Hillary, uh, greatest strength uh, associated with the most successful, dem only successful Democratic president in the last 40 years. Weakness. Rubs people the wrong, rubs many people the wrong way. All right. Barack Obama, strength? Strength. An appeal to go beyond the baby boomer cultural civil war. Uh, Let's be friends together. And his weakness? His weakness is um, little experience, particularly on foreign policy. All right. John Edwards, strength? Um, a certain uh, sort of charming eloquence. Charming eloquence. All right. And weakness? Uh, the weakness is he's never really done anything except be a trial lawyer. Michael, do you really want to be that vicious? <laughs> All right. Yes. Do you want to call a Democratic nomination? Is it obvious to you right now? No, I don't think it's obvious. Uh, Hillary Clinton obviously has a huge lead, but if Barack Obama wins Iowa, I think it's a two-candidate race up till February 5th, and I think it's possible that Obama if... could have, make, have an upset win. All right. But it, must, it has to happen in Iowa. Uh, I think, well, Iowa is where the race is closest. And I think, uh, you know, if Hillary wins Iowa and New Hampshire, and if this is held, uh, you know, she could clinch the Democratic nomination by January 29th, which is about the time in the cycle when John F. Kennedy announced he was running. Right. Okay. To the Republicans, again, just a very brief assessment. Rudy Giuliani, greatest strength. Greatest strength, 911. We know that he can handle a crisis, that he keeps his cool, and that he can operate under the greatest pressure. And worst weakness? Worst weakness is uh, a, a, a personal life that uh, leads him poorly equipped to be a royal sort of president. Mm. Mitt Romney, strength? Uh, strength, business success, which I don't think he's explained fully to us. I'd like to learn more about it. And weakness? Uh, he's come to some of his conservative positions uh, rather recently. Fred Thompson? Strength? Fred Thompson's strength is that he's uh, capable of uh, stating a kind of down-home language, uh, some fairly profound political ideas. And weakness? Uh, hasn't got into it late, uh, does not seem to have good campaign organization. Last one, John McCain, strength? Strength, uh, courage. 
He wasn't at Woodstock, as he reminded us. He was tied up elsewhere. All right. And his greatest weakness? Uh, his greatest weakness, I think, is his temper. Is he going to lose his temper, uh, go out of control? Last question. Today, the House of Representatives has 233 Democrats, 200 Republicans. There are a couple of vacancies. The Senate, 51 Democrats, 49 Republicans. Estimate the composition of these two houses after the 2008 election. Well, the Republicans are going to lose some seats in the Senate. That's fairly clear from the lineup of seats uh, and where they are. I think uh, you could see, say, 55, 45 Democrats in the Senate, something right. on that order. Uh, the House elections, if they were held today, I think the Democrats would go up to t from 233 to in the 240s, which is kind of the sweet spot uh, in the House. You have enough uh, members so that uh, you can drop a few and still hold your majority. You don't have too many so that everybody says, hey, I don't have to vote with the leadership. They've got lots of votes. Um, but I'm not sure that the dynamic is going to be the same in November 2008. I think if some issues like taxes and immigration come forward as they did in the Massachusetts 5 special election, those results could be different. Even in the Senate? Uh, well, that would affect Senate seats. Right. I mean, you've got, you know, you statistically, uh, you don't have enough Senate seats to really make statistical likelihoods. Uh, you know, you could have a situation where the Democrats win six of the cl six closest races in the last uh, election and they, they win six seats. But the presidency and the House could still go Republican, yeah, despite I think all the feeling that all the feeling that everyone, the George W. Bush's approval ratings are down in the twenties. I think, despite the, all of that, I think the uh, best chance for the Republicans of of the three is to is to win the presidency. I think there, another factor that we haven't looked at is do voters want to give Democrats total control of the federal government? Um, they weren't faced with that issue in 2006. They were faced with the issue of, do you want the Democrats to be a check on George W. Bush? Right. They said yes to that question. doesn't mean they'll necessarily say yes to the other one. In the House, we've got to see a change in dynamic on the issues because the institutional factors, uh, the money, the majority, K Street, uh, favor the Democrats to keep their majority. Right. Michael Barone, thank you very thank much. You. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us.